Go to Jude. And it reads, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. By the way, that's three references to the same group of people. Called, beloved in God the Father, kept for Jesus Christ. That's Christians. It's all of us. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Don't miss that. All Christians, and then he says, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Because one of the things that people think about apologetics and about this war language is that it stands in opposition to things like mercy, peace, and love that we're supposed to be defined by, right? And so verse 2, he says, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Verse 3, beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, epagonizomai. It it literally means to wrestle, to engage in hand-to-hand combat. So verse 2, he wants mercy, peace, and love to be multiplied to you. And in verse 3, he wants you to go hand-to-hand in combat. Which means that there is no contradiction between being a loving Christian and engaging in the combat of apologetics. Hey, welcome to season three of that they may all be one podcast with your host Shane and Holly Sands. Join us this season as we take a deep dive into waking the sleeping giant. So grab a coffee, open your Bible, and come hang out in our flex room. Let's get into this. Hello, hello. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to another podcast episode of That They May All Be One. I'm Shane. (laughs) And I'm still Holly. (laughs) Yay! And I have my coffee. So do I. I got my open Bible. So do I. And we are in our flex room. <laughs> and we are ready to go with this. Oh, yes. You hear me all so like cheerful, and we are cheerful. It's a bright, sunny day today. Uh, it's cold and windy out there. We were going to go for a walk, and that got ixnayed pretty quickly. <laughs> however, however, this cheerful sounding voices of ours, you know, I can't resist. I, before we get into it, so. I purposely was not telling Holly about today's program. We hadn't been talking about today's program. And she looked as you're making me nervous. And I said, honey, look, the the main thing that we're going to be looking at today is how we communicate with one another. (laughs) At which point she goes. Then we're in trouble. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. Uh, come back next week when we have another That's the show. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Hang it up. And what's what's funny about that is, in a lot of ways, that is really so true about what we're going to be dealing with today. So I'm going to take a sip of coffee. I want you to take a deep breath because what's about to come out of my mouth you're yeah it's not gonna be did you hear his voice crack a little bit (laughs) (laughs) the the octave went up (laughs) all right i told holly i thought that we should have had some gothic war music to begin the day's program (laughs) this is this is in my wheelhouse this is if this is going to be a soapbox episode today's episode is a soapbox episode how many of you out there, when we played that clip by Vody Bachman, what's the... Uh, what's Defending the, the faith in a hostile world. Defending the faith in a hostile world. For those of you who've kept up with me or know anything about me as an open-air preacher, apologist, uh, someone uh, who is very much in love with sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because he has saved me, uh, the... One of the Bibles that I was given early on, right after I was truly saved, the first Bible that was given to me was by uh, a a brother in Christ, Brandon Lowe. It's a John MacArthur study Bible. And 
I would turn around, but you wouldn't be able to hear my voice. And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn around. I'm going to grab it real quick because I want to read to you what he put in it. All right, and I just had stuff fall out of it. And I'm going to turn here. And it was given to me on April 30th, 2009. And it says, Jude 3, never stop contending. Oh, amen. How awesome is that? This is when when I really knew that the Lord was starting. When he had saved me in October of 2008, shortly after that is when the Lord was really just kind of pushing me in this direction. When I say pushing me, it was like pushing me. It You'd have to go back and hear the stories about way back in the day, but regardless. This is my wheelhouse. How many of you felt uncomfortable when Vody Bachman is talking about peace, love, and mercy, yay, kumbaya, s'mores, all of that good stuff, and those are characteristics that should embody a believer, and then you hear, uh, but you're to engage in hand-to-hand combat, contending for the faith that was once handed down. So, that, that, won't that make us contentious? So, <laughs> just the answer there would be we're told to contend, contend and contentious. Okay. Um, <laughs> but seriously, a lot of people think that that if. Um, you know, if I stand up for what is right, if I stand up for sound doctrine, um, I'm going to be, I'm not going to be walking in love. I'm not, I'm going to be shown to be contentious when all you're really doing is standing up for truth. Correct. So here's probably the part where things are going to start changing a little for me when we start having this conversation. Before we do that, actually, can you read out today's title of our program? It's called Rock the Boat, But Don't Sink It, and How to Have a Discussion in Love. All right. Rock the Boat, But Don't Sink It. Rock the Boat means that you are going to be pushing. The waves are pushing against you, or you're in the boat kind of going back and forth. There's some agitation that's happening somewhere, somehow. Confrontation is not a bad thing. Most of us, when we say confrontation, immediately have a negative connotation that it's going to be aggressive and hostile and it's going to be negative. Whereas true confrontation in its right form, when it is, when it is done correctly, is not only necessary it is perhaps one of the very best tools we have to grow in maturity in Christ. I think I thought that way. I, I'm sure I thought that way all of my life until I met you. Yep. And you showed me the correct way Yep. Well, to I've, be confrontational. Mm, thank you. Praise the Lord. To him be the glory. Yeah. I, I still remember the first time you went with me into downtown Pittsburgh. <laughs> Yes. And we walk down that, and I'm carrying Are You Ready Cross. Yep. Which, and if you don't know, is huge. <laughs> <laughs> and and so I, I'm, I'm going to be speaking to you from Scripture today, but also from a, a personal, it, it is going to be a personal part of me. And I try to, I don't want to overlap, you know, personal experience, though personal experience is part of it. It's more important for you to know what what God says in His script in His Word in the Scriptures. So what I'm going to do, you heard the first clip. I'm going to read two sections of clips. I mean, two sections of the Scriptures. I'm going to make a brief comment, and then I'm going to have Holly play another clip that is as powerful, if not more powerful, than the one that we just played. And it is for a whole different reason, and it may put many of you to shame. So with that, the very first scripture that I want to read to you comes out of 1 Peter, i.e., my favorite book in the Bible outside of the Gospels, starting in chapter 3, verse 13. 
Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which uh, you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. For Christ also died for sins. And that's the very beginning part of verse 18. When you look at the context of that, notice there's two things happening. Speaking, making a defense, but then also your behavior. Both are in alignment, both are correct, and you are to give a, a, an account for the hope with you for gentleness and reverence. But understand that that means that you will be speaking against those who are outside of the church. It also means that you might be speaking against those who are inside the church but are not believers, and you're going to suffer for it. Think of Stephen talking to people. Think of Paul and the false apostles. Think of the Lord Jesus with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You're, there's going to be confrontation, but you can only control you, and there's a way that you do that. Now, most people throughout the going on 15 years that the Lord has saved me, when they are encountered with sharing the gospel, and you're like, hey, we all need to be about sharing the word of God. We all need, not all of us are called to be an evangelist. That is true to some extent. There is the gift of evangelism. However, we are all, let me be really, really clear in case you are missing this somehow. We are all, every single born again believer is to share and proclaim the excellencies of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Regardless of where you're at, what you're doing, you are called to be a witness. You are called to make known and proclaim the excellencies of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are called to walk in a manner worthy of his calling and gospel. And just as the Lord Jesus walked a path where he suffered, do not think that that same gift isn't given to you. And it is a gift. We are so complacent with wanting to be comfortable in our four walls. We want to be with quote, like-minded individuals. We don't want to have to be challenged. We want to believe what we want to believe. We want to stand firm with what we believe, but we also, we don't want to engage others. We don't want to share with others that they have to repent of their sins and that right now they're going to hell because of the wrath of God abides on them. We don't want to talk with other believers about difficult doctrines, or perhaps challenge one another with Scripture because we'd be unloving. We might be causing dissension or being contentious. Or are we really being effective? You know, isn't there other ways? Maybe you should re relate to someone in the culture and speak to them. And, and you know what? Don't share the word of God right away because, you know what, with non-believers especially, we have to warm them up and show that we're just like they are but different. Oh, we should be those Christians that only display and share what's in love, like a little patty cake, just sitting there all a little warm and going, hello, and not being bold and not being brave. And in fact, I have had, here's a section of scripture that most, uh, I shouldn't say most, people have used to defend their not being vocal or 
intentional about sharing the gospel. And it's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I'm going to start reading in verse 9, but the verse is actually verse 11. Now, as to the love of the brothers and sisters, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you practice it toward all the brothers and sisters who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers and sisters, to excel even more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your own hand, work with your hands just as we instructed you so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need that doesn't that doesn't that show doesn't that tell me that I'm not supposed to uh, to engage I, I mean I I'm supposed to live a quiet life I'm I'm just supposed to that's me I don't mind supporting people I don't mind encouraging and praying for it but sharing my faith that's just that's not my gifting I just want to lead a quiet life you know there are some parts of the world where a that's not an option but b when Christians are in the more minority like in Islamic countries where Women don't have the education or the standing. And for them to speak out boldly would be, could result in punishment. But then also to speak out boldly to a man, and especially an Islamic man, and to do it publicly would bring a lot of things to bear on a woman. Holly has a clip that I, I want her to play for you, and we're going to talk about it shortly after that. And then we're going to get into the first section of our, uh, of we're going to get into the first section of our program. And yeah, just let me set it up first. Um, it, it looks like, I, we don't know where this uh, occurred, Um Obviously, it's in a foreign country, and um, there's a big meeting taking place. And the main speaker, and I'm going to probably butcher his name, is Zakir Naik. He is an Indian Islamic tele-evangelist. And the woman challenging him, is her, her name is Rose. And just listen to how this goes about. All right, so my name is Rose, and I work for Qatar Airways. I've heard you talk about religion so much, and I'll speak of the Bible because that's what I'm aware of. You say, you talk of Jesus as religious leader. But as far as I'm concerned, Jesus did not come to introduce any religion. Neither is he a religion, religious leader. What Jesus introduced in this world was the kingdom of God. There is not a single unequivocal statement. In the book of John, the Bible says that in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God and the Word was with God. And the Word became flesh. He is bigger than messenger. He's not just a messenger. It's an insult to call my Lord a messenger. Sister, sister, I ask you. We will do something to prove something, sir. What first thing I want you to put it is wrong. You agree it is wrong, then we go to the next question. I don't agree. Even though you believe the Bible is the word of God, I know Bible more than you, right? There is one thing to know the Bible, there is another thing to have the revelation of the Bible. Because you know, even when Jesus came, the people who did not understand who he was were religious leaders. They missed big time. They did not know who he was because he was hidden. I love her more and more every time I hear that clip. Wow. Praise God. So when you look at the clip, if you look it up. But again, the backdrop, here she is in front of a lot of people, and she stands boldly, and she speaks the truth, and she defends who Jesus is. She calls him God. And then she goes, it's one thing to know the Bible, but it's another to have the revelation of the Bible, which is true. Because the religious leaders, they missed it. 
Otherwise, they would have recognized the Lord of glory. And she's standing in front of everybody to somebody who is putting her down intelligence-wise, mm-hmm. who's diminishing her, mocking her. And what does she do? She does not back away. I love how she says that is an insult to my Lord. Yep. When we're defending our faith, do we even think outside of ourselves in defending the Lord? Not that he needs to be defended, but the zeal that we have for him, the love that we have for him causes, like that lady to say, you are insulting my Lord. Amen. Wow. Amen. Here in our culture, in this country, we're, we're, we try to meet, find common ground. And what that means is you got to try and capitulate a little bit. You know what? You're not God, so you, you don't know 100%. You can't say absolutely for certain, ah, uh, that objective subjective, go listen to, you know, episode one on this. You, you can't, you can't know this. So we have to try and find a way to make common ground, but that's not it. No, you stand on the truth. Yes. You proclaim the truth. And what you do is in humility and in love, but with earnestness and intensity, boldness, right. you call people out for their sin. It doesn't mean that you sit there and go, uh, and I, I hate you and I hope you go to hell. Quite to the contrary. Proverbs tells us, better is open rebuke than concealed love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. It's interesting that the world always wants us to try and pigeon toe us and tell us how we have to do uh, encounter culture. They want to tell us, especially believers talking to other believers, how you how you can be more effective in your evangelism when they themselves don't evangelize. I I, I think it was Spurgeon or something who. Someone had said, you know, the way you're going about this is all wrong. And to the reply was, okay, show me how you're doing it. Maybe it was Moody, Dwight L. Moody. Show me how you're you're evangelizing, to which inevitably would be crickets. So you're going to criticize me for something, yet you yourself are not going to be involved. So which one probably loves the Lord more? That last part wasn't D.L. Moody. That was me actually saying, who would you think loves the person, loves the Lord more? The one who is engaged and declaring and proclaiming the Lord Jesus or the one who just wants to be quiet and sit in their house? You feeling it yet? I hope so because I'm calling you out. I hear year after year, Church after church, I hear this. We need to be more engaged. We need to be more engaged. We need to be more engaged, and then nobody does it. Or they only want to try and do something that puts them on the skirts, the outskirts of it. But when it calls to actually being put in a place, putting yourself in a place where you can suffer for it, I may have seen it maybe three times. And it's ridiculous. It is absolutely, unexcusably ridiculous. If this lady can put herself out on a line where, believe it or not, after this program or whatever, do you think those who are true Islamic Muslims who see a woman talking to a man, a Muslim man like that, are going to let her go? I guarantee you there are several people who are thinking about harming her. And yet... The love of Christ compelled her. So that's my overview. That's kind of like our introduction. We're going to talk about two things in particular on rocking this boat. The first of which, how do you have a conversation with a Christian? Because, you know, you've always heard, we're just a a group of people who are, quote, like-minded Oh, sure, they're brothers and sisters, but 
they see things a little differently than we do. So we worship here and they worship there and we live our lives. They, and you know what? There you go. I almost want to just yell, how insulting is that? In what way? Because the like-mindedness that we all have is Christ Jesus incar- incarnate, him living the life we could not, dying the death we deserve, rising victoriously from the grave, ascending to the right hand of the Father. He who sits, rules, reigns, intercedes, and at a time of the Father's choosing, he is returning. That is our like-mindedness. Amen. All the other things that are there, Scripture is really clear. Don't have conversations on these words that only bring about dissension. Don't have these types of things on genealogies and all of this other stuff. But do the things that are useful for building up the body. But there does come a time when we do have to confront. Correct. And amen to that. And and the issue that the greater majority run into is, if I do that, will I be walking in love? Yep. Shouldn't I just rather, you know, say, well... Just pray for them, but I'm not going to say anything to them. Just let the Lord deal with them. Yeah, it's, you know what, I really should say something, but I don't know. And there, let me preface this. All of us must go as the Lord leads us. And I mean this in sincerity. There may be an individual that you feel like you should talk to, but you, the feelings you're having are anger or whatever inside of you. And you've just like, no, I've got to back away and I'm just going to pray for him because I don't think I can have this conversation without things getting really blown out of proportion. If that's the case, amen to you showing that you don't have a lack of maturity in that area or you are displaying some maturity by saying, I can't touch that issue. But at the same time, if it hasn't opened your eyes to showing you a need to grow in that area, then no, there's there's not an excuse for it. So there are times that God will back you away from an engagement in a, in a situation. I've had that experience. I know many others have had those experiences. That's not what we're, we're getting at here. Um, I've just talked to you about that faithful are the wounds of a friend. Proverbs is so clear about communicating with one another. And I I teach throughout, and when I say I, meaning Shane, when I talk to people, the biggest thing that we can ever learn to do is communicate, send, receive, confirm. The vast majority, over 95% of the issues that we have are from our lack of communicating and being eager to or wanting to hear, or at least listening to the other person. And we have we have episodes throughout Scripture, all throughout, that show, A, having the ability to communicate, but the ability to listen. The foremost issue that a person has to have before they engage in anything is the Word of God dwelling within them, knowing what they believe and why they believe it and not because you learned it from somebody else. Yes, please study the Word of God for yourself. Please. When I was in Norway, there was a Lutheran pastor who talked about paedo-baptism. And then after probably a good hour and a half discussion, going through just Scripture after Scripture after Scripture, finally... He was brought to the place where he said, well, I've never studied this on my own. I've only studied that which was presented to me by my teachers. Red flag. Yep. And and let me just go ahead and bring this even closer to home. So I got taught by the Southern Baptist Seminary. I got taught by Master Seminary. I got taught by Trinity Evangelical, or I got taught, so you're a, a schoolhouse, a train of thought, a religious area focusing on Baptists or Reformation or liberal or charismatic or whatever. But instead of actually taking the time yourself to say, all right, 
this is what I'm learning, but I want to go through the scriptures and I want to know what I believe and why I believe it. I want to study it and I want to have it firmly rooted in my heart. Why? Not to win a debate. And that is the vast majority of conversations between Christians today is how can I prove my point? How can I one up the individual across from me and prove that I am right? Because I've got to be right. I know where I stand, and I am right. So when I engage, it's not from love. It is from a point of proving I'm superior to you in the Scriptures, i.e., think of that Islamic person we heard. I know the Bible better than you. Instead of going, I love you, and I want to hear, and I want to know what you're thinking and why you think it and why you believe what you believe, and then I'll challenge you. I'll speak to you. I'll either agree with you or I'll disagree with you. But the Bible says iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another. A man who walks with wise men will become wise. Notice it doesn't say a person who walks with perfect people will become perfect. A person who has all the scriptures memorized will they themselves memorize all the scriptures. A person who walks with wise men, and where do we find out wisdom? It's in scripture. And the more we read Scripture, the more that we find out that there's only one perfect, one sinless, one spotless Savior, Lamb of God, Jesus. And all of us after that have daily needs of our feet being cleansed. Our feet need to be washed because we're still in dead sinful flesh. And that alone should humble us to be servants of one another so that we can engage one another in conversation on scripture non-essential, non-essential scripture should not be something where you're trying to where you're trying to one up someone there are times when you absolutely must and I, I hate to put it this way be aggressive But if someone's talking about the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ and they're in your church and they're trying to say that Jesus wasn't God, you absolutely better confront that individual openly and powerfully from the scriptures. I want you to think about the Lord Jesus Christ. He got angry several times. One time when he saw that the people were making uh, his father's house a place of business, he made a, a whip of cords and he drove out everyone. He never refused to engage. He always engaged and he would listen. As he was teaching, he would teach and when he was questioned, he would hear what was being asked of him and then he would address it. So he never cut people off. He never tried to shut down the speech. He never tried to do that. And that's, that is another problem that we have in the church today that we feel like instead of being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, that we will ask a question of someone, and then when they begin to reply, we want to shut them off. We don't want to let them speak. We We want to do some form of intimidation. We don't want to hear what they have to say. And if you're one of those who does that, you have to ask yourself, why? Why do I not want somebody to hear what you're saying? If you're so comfortable in what you believe and why you believe it, then what are you afraid of? Seriously, what are you afraid of? Why are you not going to then say, maybe this person knows something that can help grow me in Christ? Why am I not going to let my brother or sister speak and be blessed? Because they do have the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit has sealed them and indwells them. I just, I think, honey, it's just, I, I really think that there comes a point in time where we're just afraid to speak. We've learned from society, from all, I think technology has been such a, a horrible thing in this. We've, we can have so much going on with things, but, you know, technology has just brought us to a place of 
I just want to get my news and headlines. I'm too busy. Yeah, but I think you hit the nail on the head when you were talking about suffering. We, nobody wants to suffer. Yeah. And and we've been fed the lie for a long time. And when a lot of churches where they, we were taught that we didn't have to suffer. Yeah. But of necessity and following Jesus, we are called to suffer as yes. he suffered. And to put yourself out there on the line will include suffering. I mean, the world will shame you. Other Christians will shame you. <laughs> yes. But you have to lay down that pride. You have to lay down that fear and say, no, I'm, I'm going to speak out just like this Rose lady. She, she was bold. Yep. She didn't care what the repercussions would be to her speaking out. She spoke. And that's what we have to do, even though we're scared, even though we're afraid of what might happen of, or what friends will lose or what connections will lose. We still have to take that stand for truth and for the gospel and not back down. Amen. Amen, honey. Um, you know, First John 4 tells us there's no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear and the one who fears is not perfected in love because what? Fear involves punishment, and none of us want to feel uncomfortable. I, I I wholeheartedly tell you that if I get to sit back in the recliner and never have to do a thing again and just be comfortable, and God grants me that, okay. I mean, that man, I might I might jump on that bandwagon because none of us want to encounter suffering or discipline or shame and particularly we don't want to look unintelligent yeah i mean i can relate to that one yeah i mean think of it when you have a discussion with another christian it's nine times out of ten and I, i'm just saying that for effect i don't have the stat to back that up but when you haven't engaged another believer and you have different views it's combative. The confrontation is good, but it becomes combative in the in the negative because we don't want to feel like we're not intelligent. All right. And I'm going personally going through that stage in life where um, I, I forget what I'm saying mid thought. <laughs> yeah. So um, that becomes more of a challenge for me personally, um, and plus my speech impediment kind of rises up to meet me yeah. at the worst times. Mm -hmm. um, and I stutter and I, I stumble through my words and then I can't think of words and then I forget what I'm saying. And yep. <laughs> so there's that element of shame for me too. But am I going to let that cause me to be quiet when I'm faced with something that is contrary to the word that's going on in the church that shouldn't be in the church? No, I am going to speak. Yes. So when you're having those types of conversations... You first, A, I'm going to come back to it time and time again because this whole season we've been building off of this same thing. You need to have the Word of God in you. The Word of God has got to be richly dwelling within you because if it is, then you can engage another person and you can feel comfortable. Now, does that mean that you might be asked a question you don't have the answer to? Yeah. Yeah. And what's wrong with that? And you know, what I've told people too is if you don't know the answer, either tell them, I don't know, but I will research it and get back with you. Or you can tell them, research it yourself. Yep. Or Look in the Bible, see what the Bible says. Research what this thing is that you're doing that's not biblical. Go and see what others have said about that. Amen. And if we happen to have a, a topic where it's a non-essential and someone brings out something and says, but what about this? And you really don't know it, and it challenges you? Don't be afraid to say, all right, hey, I haven't heard that before, and that sounds kind of intriguing. I need to research that. Yeah. Because, A, that would mean that you have at least the humility to say, right. look, I don't have all the information. If I had the Word of God perfectly memorized, do you realize that I still would not be able to always defend everything. It actually may make me more haughty. But the fact is, is that it's the word of God. 
and none of us are God. And we all learn at different stages of our life. When I first started out into evangelism and into open-air preaching and apologetics, there was a part of me that was a lot more pronounced, vocal, uh, confrontational. As I've grown older, and the Word has performed more of its work in me, not that I'm not confrontational, but I'm learning that the way I can confront someone may be different. I can use different avenues that may be more effective. Different circumstances, different places, different environments. It shows me that I'm growing, that I'm seeing the Word of God differently. In fact, even this morning, Holly was sharing with me how she read a scripture that had never stuck out to her the way it did until today. The Word of God is living and active. It's a relationship. And we grow in our relationships. So the key is is that you have to know what you believe and why you believe it, but don't be afraid to engage. So, so what if somebody has more knowledge? If you truly love Christ, if you truly love the Father, if you truly love the Holy Spirit, if you fervently love your brothers and sisters from the heart, if you love the things that God loves and hate the things that God hates, you have nothing to be afraid of. You have nothing to be afraid of. We're all afraid that we're going to be judged or suffer humiliation or fear or shame or something that's negative. But when we're in the body, whether you think the gifts of the Spirit continue or whether or not you think that there's a rapture or not, whether or not you hold that we can eat certain things or go and do certain things, whether you can drink or not drink, whatever the case may be, these non-essentials, we can engage in these conversations with one another, and it's okay to let people speak. So the next time you're having a conversation with somebody in the church, and they ask you a question, and if they shut you off, be polite and say, I'm trying to answer. Would you let me finish, please? And if they continue then to shut you down, go, so you're really not wanting to actually talk. You just want to try and have your dominance. You want to shut down expression. You want to shut down talking. You don't want to hear that. Because if I was wrong, after you heard my complete statement, you could still correct me. Instead, you're, you're not letting me speak, which is contrary to the word of God. And if somebody does let you speak, assume that they're truly listening. Assume the best from the individual that you're engaging with. This is a call to all of us. We don't need to live in our own little bubble where we think that we can prove the better point. If your goal is to win an argument and not to know Christ or to have others grow in Christ and you grow in Christ, even if you are the one who has the information correct and your goal isn't to grow in Christ by learning more how to engage like Christ engaged or to walk in a better way, don't you know you've already lost before you began? You're the very cause of the problem. Our conversations with believers should be a little rough, should be a little contentious from time to time, especially when we are talking about truly important things that have impact, and I mean serious impact in the church, talking about the reliability of the scriptures, talking about justification talking about the gospel, talking about the incarnation of Christ, talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, talking about our fellowship and unity in the body, that our like-mindedness isn't supposed to be something that divides us, but that brings us together. So could you, who are a Southern Baptist, if the only church was around was a 
Calvinist Reformation Church? Could you go in there and worship? Could the reverse be said of you who are that reformed believer going into uh, maybe a, a charismatic church? Could you go and worship? If the answer to that is no, then your like-mindedness isn't in unity in Christ. Your like-mindedness is a division of hostility. You heard me correct. I said a division of hostility. You're allowing things that should be bringing us together to separate us. That's how religious denominations begin. I don't know if I have much more to add to how we can have conversations with believers. The key is to love God, to love your brother and sister, to engage in conversation purposefully. We must continually sharpen one another with the word of God. And as we have our discussions, we need to do so visibly so that others can see and grow and learn. And we have to assume We must come from the standpoint of, I love the Lord, I love my brother and sister, they love the Lord, they love me, and we are here to build one another up. Any other viewpoint is a viewpoint of the flesh. It's not going to come out well, and it's not going to leave the right imprint. We've got to continuously encourage one another. And yes, believer, you cannot remain quiet, which will take us into our next topic, probably the one that's, I don't know, I don't know if it's easier or more difficult to engage non-believers than believers. What do you think? I think it depends on what the subject is. Yeah. And, And the person you're speaking with. Are they hostile or are they... um or are they wanting to know? Yeah. So it just depends on the situation, I think. So you think they're about the same, perhaps? Could be. Yeah. Could be. Yep. It's interesting that today, you and I both were impressed by the same verse from Proverbs. I know you don't have it right off your hand, so I'm not going to ask you to read I it. I do, actually. I have oh. it in front of me. Ooh, even better. <laughs> well, I need to hear you speak a little bit more, because I've been doing my little thing, so... Why don't you read it? It comes from Proverbs 14, verse 29, and it says, He who is slow to anger has great understanding and profits from his self-control, but he who is quick-tempered exposes and exalts his foolishness for all to see. So here, here's the deal. There's, there's so many different scriptures that kind of take us into this area. Don't cast your pearl before swine. I read the uh, First Peter, you know, all, you know, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope within you, yet with gentleness and reverence or respect, whichever you know translation you're looking at. Um, then you're going to see scriptures like this. And it's so important to remember that one who is slow to anger has great understanding. But what does it mean to have great understanding? Well, it tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It tells us that the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Here we come right back to it, ladies and gentlemen. Ding, ding, ding. Have the Word of God in you. Believe me, I have a point that when I finish up with this, We're going to come right back to the main problem of the main problem of the main problem. And I haven't even hit on it yet, but we have talked about it in another episode. He who has the word of God richly dwelling within them. He who has, he, she, has the word of God richly dwelling within them. He who has those things is at peace. You can go into any environment. I once had a confrontation in San Francisco with a group of black Hebrew Israelites, and they are not known for their gentle disposition and wanting to engage in kind apologetics. No, I had one of them cursing me, reading a curse to put over me. 
and through it all led me right down to it as the one tries they were waiting for the police to leave and as soon as the police left he jumped in my face and i started laughing going i knew this was coming i could see what you were doing but let's go to Galatians, and let's see how this interaction is happening in Galatians. And you tell me who's being more Christ-like here. And I didn't have to raise my voice. I didn't have to act in an unbecoming way. I just said, so are what is what you're doing the fruit of the Spirit or the deeds of the flesh? At which point you have a curse read over you. When you have the Word of God richly dwelling in your, and your desires to make Christ known— and you're dependent upon the Lord to give you utterance and guidance, and, and you have all of this richly dwelling within you, then you no longer have to get aggravated. You may get aggravated. We're, we're still in the flesh. You are less likely to get thrown into a fit of rage or upset or laughing to try and brush off things because you have the Word of God richly dwelling within you. You can engage the world, whether you're talking to a scientist who believes in science, or whether you're be- talking to a Muslim, or whether you're talking to an atheist, or whether you're talking to someone who just doesn't care. They're, they haven't put any thought into it at all, and they just don't care. Believe it or not, there's probably more people like that than you think. You can engage someone in love. And you can engage them firmly, resolutely, and if you have to, boldly. And you can come to them and you can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, of his calling in gospel. You remember, honey, when we went to Oktoberfest in Cincinnati. I could never forget that. So, very quickly, ladies and gentlemen, if you twice... The first time was probably was definitely the most awesome one of all. <laughs> so the first time, uh, if you don't know, Cincinnati, Ohio, has an Oktoberfest that is, I think, the second or third largest Oktoberfest in the world. It is a drinking debauchery. So one year I was asked to go down, and I was going to meet with some people. They wanted to go down, and they wanted to go and uh, preach the gospel, and at the last moment, they called out, nope, we can't do it. Holly and I were left with the decision, do we go ahead and do it, or do we trust the Lord and go and engage as he's led us? Friends, if you want to know what a, it could be a kind of a, a fearful thing and having the enemy put in your flesh all sorts of concerns and doubts, Look down the line of about 100,000 drunken people in all sorts of costumes who despise you, who mock you. Yeah, he, he was preaching, and there was a crowd encircling him who I thought he was going to get beat up. <laughs> well, that I was so scared. Then there were the people at um, in Asheville, North Carolina. But the key is, is that when we went. Oh, yeah, Asheville. Oh. where the people were close to you saying we should just go surround him and take turns beating him yes. up type of thing. Didn't even know I was with you. Yeah. What drives you to engage the world? Not everyone's called to be an evangelist. No. I And, and I'm sorry, it, and the guy in Ireland with the cane, he was going to whack you with his cane. <laughs> yeah. I just, <laughs> that was... That was crazy. I've had people. That was a show. That yeah. was quite a show. Yeah. I've had people come up and say that I should be taken out and beaten. have told me that. Um, I've, I've been spit on. Um, but when you walk into areas to go and proclaim the gospel, there are some that are going to be more open to aggression than others. However... Whenever you bring the gospel, wherever you bring the gospel, that includes the church. Yeah, I I said that. You're going to be met with opposition. You're going to be met with vitriol, hatred, disdain, mocking, shaming. It's a gift. And the reason why we don't understand that it's a gift is because we don't study. When you engage a non-believer in conversation, it is important 
to first find out where they're coming from. I, when I was overseas, I engaged with people who had never heard the gospel. And we're talking about in Scotland where the Reformation was signed. I stood on the spot where the Reformation was actually signed. And people there had never heard the gospel. So now you, you got to start asking questions and, and questions are like, well, do you believe that there might be a God? Okay. Well, if you don't believe there's God, then you can start asking questions. And now you're, you're engaging someone with love. Think of Acts chapter 17. Paul was reasoning and arguing with people in the marketplaces, but when he got in the Aragopas, he said, Hey guys, here's the basis. We're not going to talk about the law and all of this, even though he actually was talking about the law and all of this. He started engaging from, there's a creator. And so then going down and how it's God who's responsible for all of creation. So it is important that we engage with people and we do so not in such an aggressive manner. Uh, open air preaching, for example, uh, a lot of people when they when they find out that as an open air preacher I engage in open air preaching, they immediately think of those people that you find on YouTube who are pr- predominantly calling people all sorts of vile names and acting in absolutely repugnant ways. That's what they assimilate open air pr- preaching with. Oh. You must be, you don't look like someone who spews hate out of your mouth. You don't look like you're purposely going out of your way to enrage people. And I don't. You have to be able to have conversations and know that when you are engaging someone, they're going to say things and do things to try and keep you from sharing the gospel and sharing the word of God. And sometimes... It's not so that they don't hear it. It's so that they can keep you from sharing it with others who would be listening. In today's world, in today's culture, because we have all this technology like I talked about before, we're so used to one-liners. We're so used to these little headlines where we get our news from. You know, we read this headline, Billy Bob assaults and tortures a chicken on Saturday. And so you see this article, uh, and it may even say Billy Bob, who is a uh, Southern Baptist, attacks and tortures a chicken. And you see this headline, and you think, oh my goodness, man, these hypocrites in the church, they're attacking animals now. But because we have lost the ability to really listen and understand instead of opening up the article and reading and then going down to where like less than 10% of the people will get to like the last couple of paragraphs where they would say, and in all fairness, Billy Bob, who is a Southern Baptist saw a rooster acting like it was on rabies going after his neighbor who happened to be a Muslim's, one-year-old child and was going and getting ready to attack it. And so he had to fend it off and ended up killing the rooster before it caused damage to his neighbor's child. At which point you would go, hold on, that's not at all what that headline was saying. And that's what the world wants to do. It wants to confuse. It wants to disrupt. It wants to keep you from hearing and knowing the truth. It wants to keep you silent. And the technique that is most used in culture today, which sadly has been learned because we have become too busy, and I'm getting back to the busy because I'm going to finish up with the busy and something else here in just a second. How many times have you seen where people who are conservative going to liberal campuses and then all of a sudden, instead of being allowed to speak, they start screaming and yelling putting up posters. They want to stop the speech. They don't want the speech, and they call it hateful, homophobic. They they call it all sorts of names, and they try to shut it down so you cannot hear it. 
or if you're speaking, you just start screaming, and, and so you start over-talking someone because the goal isn't for to learn and to grow. It is to suppress you. It is to keep you from speaking. And if the goal there was that this is you against them, then you'd be in a world context. You're more probably inclined to yell over them, which you may actually do at some point, but different story. But if you realize that they cannot shut up the word of God, that the gospel is going forth, God will have his word go forth, and it will not be shut up, and it will perform its work for which he sent it out to do. Then you in love can say, I'm not going to cast my my pearls before swines. You're not trying to engage at all. All you're trying to do is disrupt, humiliate, shut down. You don't care because you know the truth and you just want to shut it down. You're in such despair that you cannot deal with this. You're then able to go, hey, if anybody wants to talk with me, you can find me here or come over here but I'm not going to engage in this. I refuse to because, see, God will save his people. They cannot stop the word of God from going forth. However, that does not keep you from the most important part, which I'm now going to finish up with. How do you have a conversation with either a believer or a non-believer in love? How can you rock the boat? How can you challenge a non-believer that that their views are leading them straight to hell? How can you have a conversation with a believer on a sensitive topic or on doctrine without it getting to a place where there's a root of bitterness coming up, at least on your part? Slow down and be in God's Word. Slow down. If there's so much in your life going on right now where you don't have time to be alone with God, and in his word, you need to cut things out. And I don't care how you, how important you think it is. If you value anything above knowing God and being in time with him in prayer, and I don't care if you tell me that you have six kids, two jobs, and everything else going on, if you get to a place where you put anything over God and spending time alone with him and having that time, You're going to be one of these people who wants to stop and shut down and you're not going to be comfortable and you're not going to have the ability to to grow. One of the things that I really respected about Holly was that we were at a place in our life where we were busy. By necessity, we were busy and she she had soon discovered that she did not have really the quality time that she needed to spend with the Lord. She made the sacrifice then to start setting her alarm clock for like 340, 345 in the morning to get up to have that time with the Lord before she got into everything else. Friends, I want to tell you that is maturity. That's humbling because You're looking at another image bearer who's going, I need this so much, and I realize I've got other things going on, but I need this, and I have to have this, that she made a sacrifice to lose sleep, to give other things up, so that she could have that time with the Lord. I'm humbled by that. That's the key. Holly and I used to have sometimes some discussions where they could almost get a little contentious in the sense that we would be talking about different doctrines. You know how our conversations usually go now? Hey, I was reading, do you have a thought about this? Or I was blessed in this, I was blessed in this. And we spend more time talking about Christ and how he's blessing us in his word and how that the Father is just so kind to us. Do you realize that it changes when you start setting aside the things of the world so that you can have time with God? How much easier it is to just enjoy fellowship with one another, to encourage one another? 
and how much easier it is to engage the world with the gospel. How do you have this conversation? You're going to rock the boat. You need to rock the boat. You absolutely must engage in hand-to-hand combat. You must contend for the faith. And if you are not, the problem is in the mirror, you. It is not anybody else. It is not the church. It is not your coworkers. It's not the environment you're in. It's you. You need to get off your butt. You need to to humble yourselves, bow your knee, and beg God to strengthen you and to give you a spirit of power, love, and discipline, which he has already said to have given you. You need to ask him to restore to you the joy of of his salvation. You need to beg him to let him to let you declare his praises or like Jeremiah that your your bones would be on fire unless you would speak. We're complaining all the time about where our country is going and where the world is going, and yet the vast majority of people are afraid to be humiliated. Hebrews tells us that Christ suffered outside the gate, so let us go outside the gate to join with him, what? Bearing his reproach. Because we're not looking for an earthly dwelling, but we're searching for the heavenly city. We are searching. We are on our path to home, to being with Christ. And if Christ suffered, shouldn't we get off the couch? Be so loving of your fellow brother and sister in Christ that you will openly engage. And let's just say that you both believe in a certain doctrine. Don't be afraid to talk about it. Don't be afraid that somebody might know something more than you. Isn't that good? And if somebody doesn't know as much as you, aren't you glad that God is using you to help your brother or sister grow? All of this comes back down to you're not studying, you're not praying, and you're being too busy with the pleasures of this world. You're being too busy with the things of this world, and it is choking out the word. You want to wake the sleeping giant? Look in the mirror, start taking a stand, start contending for the faith, start loving your brothers and sisters, start loving the image bearers, and go engage the culture. And refuse to capitulate, refuse to say that I must give up any of my beliefs so I can talk with you. No, Jesus is Lord whether you say he is or isn't. I'll love you enough to still talk with you, but if you keep walking away, that is on you. When was the last time you shared the gospel? When was the last time you had someone get upset with you for sharing the gospel? When was the last time that you actively engaged in a discussion with another believer on anything? we got to be busy. The time is short. The days are short. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us today. Make sure and join us next week as we continue our wake-up call to the sleeping giant. And whatever platform you're listening to us on, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and rate us. If you're listening on YouTube, subscribe. Click on that bell icon and be notified every time we get a new video out. If you see us on social media, make sure to give us that shout out. Those interactions will really get our algorithms going. And remember, the glory of the gospel is that when the church is absolutely different from the world, she invariably attracts it.